Hi, this is Ned Siegfried from Siegfried & Jensen. As proud sponsors of BeliefCast, we hope you are inspired by Todd's weekly podcasts, which contain so many courageous stories of recovery and personal growth. Remember, it's not what happened in the past that matters, it's what happens in the future. We invite you all to work hard and be optimistic about your future. Enjoy today's podcast. Welcome back, everybody. This is Todd Sylvester with the Todd Inspires Belief Cast. Thank you for tuning in once again. You guys are fantastic. I'd like to give a shout out to our sponsors, Siegfried and Jensen, Wasatch Recovery, I Hill Institute, Veracity Networks, and Living Intervention, uh, Living Recoveries Interventions. Um, great people who are doing great things. So thank you for supporting this. It gets the word out to so many people. And um, the previous guests that I've had on have been fantastic. And today's going to be no different. Today, we are joined by a gentleman named Scott Wilhelm. Scott, thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much, Todd, for having me on. It's an honor. Yeah. Well, I'm so excited, Scott. Um, you know, I've, I've done a lot of research on you and your story is absolutely incredible. And I can't wait for our listeners to hear it. But let me give a little background on Scott. So Scott, uh, uh, from sinner turned saint. I love that. Um, he went from panhandling on the side of the highway off ramp to detox treatment and Bible college in a matter of six months. Scott with a decade and a half of, uh, in active addiction, tells how uh, he went from heavy heroin addiction to speaking in churches, schools, jails, and sharing his message of hope and strength. He's now six years clean and sober. I mean, dude, congratulations. Thank you very much. That is so awesome. Uh, you were born and raised uh, our north of Toronto, where you've been blessed with two beautiful children and a loving, supporting wife, um, who I've uh, we, she's the one that originally reached out to me to have you on the show. So I'm so glad that she did that. Um, you're now also an owner of a successful pool installation company and you're just doing great things. Um, uh, you know, we're going to talk about how you turn that pain of, you know, of, of addiction and how your story of recovery is building a solid foundation through faith in God, the 12 step recovery and living a life of integrity, which I absolutely love. So, Scott, um, why don't we start off? Tell our listeners where you, where did you grow up, and tell us a little bit about your childhood. Yeah, sounds good. So um, the start of my life is actually kind of crazy. So my mom, in her mid twenties, uh, moved to California. Um, I live in uh, I, li I now live in she actually sorry she was from Toronto. So okay. when she was in her mid when she was in her mid twenties, she moved to California. You know, a little just a little vacation trip. Ended up staying for a few years and meeting my biological father and got pregnant with him and he's a native to San Diego. Um, so they ended up moving back to Toronto when they were having my mother and or having, having me uh -huh. and um, they my father struggled with active addiction and okay. he didn't he didn't stay in Toronto very long and he ended up leaving the country. And I actually didn't speak to him for about 10 years after that. Um, oh, really? So, yeah. So it was a bit of a rocky start with, uh, yeah. you know, where, where my mom met my father and then him leaving, I'd say I was probably one or two years old, but from that time on, uh, it was, it, it, it got smooth. Uh, my mom met what I call my father, who is my stepdad. And, um, she was with him for, uh, until she passed away actually. So he raised me and I had a, I had a, I had a fairly, fairly normal childhood. Um, you know, I had two siblings, I played hockey. Um, but there was always something inside of me that I, I think there were abandonment issues, um, okay. self self-worth issues. There was, um, you know, feelings of inadequacy and I just felt like I didn't fit in. I felt like I didn't measure up. Oh. Um, of course, as a young child, I didn't fully understand those issues. I just felt like an outsider yeah. and that, that kind of followed me throughout grade school. Um, you know, I was never really bullied or picked on, but again, there was just something inside of me that just felt like just almost like a void in my life. Yeah. And I wasn't, I wasn't really sure what it was from. Yeah. So, but like, really like it, it was a normal childhood. I didn't have any any traumas or tragedies or anything like that. Uh, my parents were, they raised me well, they raised me right. 
And, um, you know, we weren't wealthy, we weren't poor, we were kind of middle of the road, right? We, we never went without. Um, so there wasn't, there really wasn't too much to speak of in my early childhood days. Sure. Well, I think you also, Scott, uh, you lay out kind of what a lot of kids struggle with fitting in, not believing that they're good enough. And I think every one of us on some level go through that. Um, you know, looking back now as a, you know, what were some of the, maybe the biggest lessons you learned as a child? And when you look back on, you know, again, you know, your dad in active addiction, you know, your parents divorcing or whatever. And now just looking back, what were some of the biggest lessons you learned? Um, well, when I look back now, I realized that I was really just a normal kid. Um, <laughs> like realistically, like I was actually thinking about this exact question and, and it, it and I started thinking about the kids who actually got bullied in high school, mm-hmm. uh, or not in, in grade school, elementary school. And, and I never got picked on. Like, I wish I just knew that I was just me and I, and there was nothing wrong with me. And, yeah. um, yeah, that's really it. Yeah. So, um, so you, you know, like you said, you had a fairly normal childhood and normal meaning we all had our struggles trying to fit in. <laughs> that's pretty yeah. normal. Um, yeah. so, you know, you spent a decade and a half of addiction and when did that start? Did you start, you know, at a young age, would you, you know, kind of maybe get into that and then just get into your story on how addiction overtook your life? Yeah, for sure. So it was really, I really transitioned in high school. Um, so the town I grew up in, there's, you know, a lot of, a lot of marijuana and, you know, grade nine smoking weed and stuff like that. Um, so I was introduced to marijuana at an early age and, you know, stealing beers from your parents' fridge, all that right. stuff. Yeah. Um, but what happened was I was, I grew up in a small town. And then when I went to high school, we didn't have a high school. So we went to a bigger town to go to high school. Okay. So that's kind of when the doors opened up for me. And I realized I had an opportunity to kind of reinvent myself. Yeah. Um, so I fell, I found a group of, uh, another group of kids, um, and they were into actually partying, you know, like getting drunk on Friday nights and smoking weed and they were doing ecstasy and I started hanging out with them, of course, you know, being influential and wanting to fit in. Yeah. I started, I started doing that with them. Um, and I remember my second semester, grade nine, I didn't pass a single class. And I had never, like, I had never failed a class before then. So it was, it was a very quick change in my attitude, uh, in my demeanor, um, on my outlook on authority. Um, So things, things really started to change there quickly. But what else happened was I realized that this crowd that I was hanging out with, you know, I've, at least I felt at the time that they accepted me and they liked yeah. me. And I, f- I finally felt like I fit in. Right. Yeah. And all, and all I had to do was hang out with them and party with them and drink right. with them and, you know, do drugs with them um, and skip class and, you know, do stuff like that. So, you know, it seemed like a fair trade-off for myself. Um, and right. I, you know, at the time I was having fun and all, it, it, it was all a good time. You know, I also got a girlfriend and things were really starting to look up for me at the time (laughs) Yeah. Um, or or so I thought. But, you know, when I when I look back now, I realize that these are just the foundations of, you know, addictive behaviors and addictive paths um, and the beginning of uh, of the progression of addiction, what I would call. Um, Was your was your mom aware of what was going on at this point? So, you know, my mom also. At this age, my mom, you know, looking back was starting to show some signs of um, a functioning alcoholic, you know, Mm, she was, you know, more of a binge drinker. So what actually ended up happening was, and this all kind of plays into my high school experience is that my mom, she would actually, by the time I was 16, she was buying us all of our alcohol, like me and all my friends. Oh, wow. Yeah. So she would buy us all of our alcohol and she was under the mindset that if if, if he's doing it, if he's doing it at home, right. You know, at at least I can, I can watch him. Right. But yeah, at the same time, like, you know, she's going to the liquor store and buying $200 worth of alcohol for 16 year olds. Right. So 
my house actually became like the party spot. It was the spot to be on a Friday night. So they were definitely condoning it and supporting it. Um, and my dad was working three jobs to kind of support the family. So he really wasn't, you know, around that much. Um, so yeah, to answer your question, she definitely knew what we were doing. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard uh, a lot of parents have done something similar. Like, Hey, if they're going to do it anyways, I'm going to just kind of be the one helping them get there just because it's a way of maybe feeling like they're in control and keeping you safe on some level, you know? Exactly. So obviously this progressed, you know, you, you got a girlfriend now and you're doing, you think like everything, life is good. You, you're accepted. At least it feels that way. So yeah, take yeah. it from there, Scott. Yeah. So again, by, by the time I'm 16, I'm really, I'm really making my own decisions at this point in my life. Uh, like a no curfew. My parents weren't checking up on my grades. They weren't like at, I was basically an adult. I could just come and go as I please do what I yeah. wanted. If I took off for the weekend, you know, he'll be home Sunday for school type deal. So, um, and at this age, I'm just continually making bad decisions. Yeah. Decisions. Um, so I basically, um, nothing too much changes. I'm not doing, I'm started doing Coke. Uh, Coke was, cocaine was, was, was a big drug around where we lived. Um, so I started doing cocaine and, you know, it took me two extra years to graduate high school. And it's funny because I start looking around, I'm 18, 19, and all these people who I was partying with, they've all gone off to university and college and mm -hmm. they're, do, they're doing things with their lives, right? Yeah. And I'm like, I just felt like I'm sitting there twiddling my thumbs like, mm, like <laughs> you know, like now what am I supposed to do? Like, where did everyone go? Um, and that's when I, I started to see a glimpse of the fact that I was a little different than everybody else, that I, yeah. I really wasn't in control, but um, I also wasn't ready to stop. So I kind of let that continue on into my 20s. Um, something else that didn't help me was I inherited like $40,000 when I was 20. Um, oh, wow. So, yeah. so that, that really fueled my addiction. It made it so you know, I didn't have to worry about working and I didn't have to, I didn't have to worry so much about money at the same time. I could just kind of, you know, float around and be a yeah. drug addict really. Um, so what happened was I had been doing Coke for so long that it had gotten to the point where whenever I would do Coke, I would get really paranoid and I would just be really weird to be right. honest with you. Yeah. I'll get all these really weird mannerisms. And uh, it kind of brings me to the to the next phase in my life is where I was introduced to um, perks, oxys, and the whole um, narcotic family of drugs. Um, and I found that once I started doing oxys, I didn't. It wasn't like I felt like no one noticed, right? <laughs> like I, I I felt like I was normal. Like I felt like yeah. I could I could do it, and I wasn't all weird. I didn't have to hide in a bedroom by myself. I could. Yeah. I could still work. I could still do what I want to. And it made me more productive at work. It made me um, just, I just, I felt like Superman. That's the best way to describe it was I yeah. felt like I could do anything. Yeah. So I, sorry, after you. Well, I was going to say, you know, again, I think very common, you know, people, you know, when they get on that oxy, they kind of had the similar responses, man. I felt like I could do anything. I finally felt confident. And that's the scary part because it's not, necessarily real. I mean, it, it's real in the moment, but it's, it's caused by something synthetic versus coming inherently from you. Right. Yeah, exactly. I hear that, I hear that a lot. Yeah. I, I, I was listening to one of your podcasts and I heard someone say it in almost that exact sentence. And I was yeah. like, yeah, it makes sense. So, but the thing was the, th the other thing was I was very naive. I didn't realize the hook and dagger that, um, that opioids came with. Um, as in terms of, you know, once you do it for like a week or two straight, you can't just stop. There's no yeah. stopping doing them. So um, around this time, I had actually broken up with my high school sweetheart and I was uh, dating uh, another another girl who now is my wife. Um, and I was very good at hiding my second identity from her. Uh, she was, you know, she was normal. She could go to the bar and have some drinks on a Saturday night and, and that would be the end of it. But I was, yeah. you know, I was at that point, I was good at, good at hiding my addiction to opioids. 
So by now I'm kind of like in my mid twenties and my wife tells me that she's pregnant. Mm. Um, 20, I'm 25, I believe. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm in my, in my mid twenties and she's like, I'm pregnant. And that was like a big light bulb went off in my head. And I could definitely see these patterns in my life yeah. where I'm, you know, struggling to not party seven nights a week. And I never have any money in my bank. And did yeah, that I'm, scare, did that scare you when you heard the news? I mean, as, as exciting as it can be, but where you were at, I, I bet that was a little scary going, Oh my gosh, I got a kid on the way. It was, it was scary. But at the time I tried to use that fear as motivation. Okay. I tried to tell myself, okay, you finally have a reason to stop living this life now. Cause before I had no one to be accountable to. Right. And now, yeah. and now in, in my, you know, in, in my head, I'm like, you don't want to do what your dad did to you, to your daughter. Like you need to, you don't yeah. want to be the same person that your dad was to you. So I tried my absolute hardest to use that as motivation yeah. and, and just get my life together. And like, I remember that time. And I remember that time very clearly in my life and I couldn't, there was like, there was no stopping me. It was almost like it got worse. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I, you know, sometimes, you know, someone having a kid, I've heard that it'll, it'll straighten you up and you kind of start to fly. Right. But other times it can kind of go the other direction too. So I appreciate you kind of sharing that part of it as well. Yeah. Yeah. No worries. So my wife was like, and she, she could kind of see some weird, she could kind of see some, some tendencies that were concerning to her. And mm -hmm. so she was a little weary uh, but I convinced her that, you know, we can do this and, you know, we can get a house and I can, I can provide for you. Yeah. So, but of course I couldn't stop. And I basically just doubled down, uh, on, on my drug use. So I remember the day that my wife became, or my, that I remember the day my wife went into labor and I was mm -hmm. at work and she calls mm -hmm. me and she's like, okay, this is happening. You need to come home right now. I was like, okay, I'm on my way. Hang up the phone call my drug dealer. I'm like, I need a handful of pills because wow. I'm going to be stuck. I'm going to be stuck in the hospital for who knows how long. And I can't, you know, I can't start withdrawing in, in the hospital. Yeah. So of course I couldn't find any. So three hours goes by and she calls me and she's like, where are you? And you know, you know, classic, classic addict. I'm making up every excuse in the world to where sure. I am. So I ended up getting to the hospital. We had the baby very quickly. And I remember the nurse, she said, you can stay the night or you can go home. And of course I wanted to go home and do my pills. So I went yeah. home. I left my wife there with our brand new baby by herself. Uh, it was definitely not a moment that I'm proud of by any means. Right. Right. So like, so, and then, at this point, I'm definitely, I'm, I'm going down here. I'm going downhill real quickly. So my wife is home one day and the, a gentleman from she realized that this problem is more than I realize. And, and I think it's time to, you know, we have to address this problem. Right. Yeah. So, um, I tried methadone. I went on methadone and that, that, that didn't really work for me. Um, and we just kind of do this back and forth pattern where, you know, I, I can't pay rent. We move out, we go to my parents and we're just really struggling at life. So we go through that for a few years and finally she's had enough. She's like, I'm done. It's time for me to move on. You've, you know, just wasted the past five years of my life. So I convinced her I'll, I'll go to treatment. Like I'll, I'll go to treatment for you. I have a problem and I will go to treatment. So I ended up enrolling in a treatment center. It's a uh, 90 day uh, in house. And of course I'm there for all the wrong reasons. Right. I'm not there. I'm yeah. not, I'm not, I'm not there for myself. I'm there to save my job and my yeah. family and just trying to please everybody else except for me. So of course it, it didn't work. Like I, I, 
I literally gra- I relapsed the day I graduated. I, I walked, I walked out the front doors. I went to my drug dealer's house and, and I, and I got high. Yeah. Wow. So it was definitely, and I remember my last day of treatment. I remember, you know, you eat breakfast, you go to your room, you start packing your stuff. And I am crying like a baby all day because my, my brain didn't want to relapse like my, the emotional side of me didn't yeah. want to relapse because right. of all this work I'd done. Yeah. And I knew that I was going to relapse because I physically couldn't stop my body from calling my drug dealer and going there. And I just cried all day. It wow. was, it was, a, yeah, it was, there was, that's like the one, like one moment I'll never forget that I, I could not control my urges to, to use. Yeah. Well, and I think you, you spell out a good point and, and this is good for our listeners, you know, and I, and I work at a treatment center as well. And, you know, when someone comes in for the wrong reasons, like you said, for trying to save a job or a family, which is, and those are important things, but if they're not doing it for themselves, it's amazing the difference between when someone comes in doing it for themselves versus I'm doing it for other things. And so the hope is they get to that point where they're doing it for themselves. So, but obviously, I mean, you were ready to go get high the moment you left treatment. And I'm sure yeah. that was a scary moment. Yeah, it, it, it was, it was all lined up. And the other, the other thing that I glossed over quickly was that um, not long before I went to treatment, I, I had met someone that took me to what I call, you know, the under the underworld of, of drug addicts. Like he took mm-hmm. me to the next level where I was just sniffing oxys before he introduced me to smoking fentanyl, smoking crack uh, mm-hmm. and IV use. And, and, you know, wow. I get, I get, I get asked a lot. They're like, how do you, how do you start using needles? And I was like, it's not just one day where you click your fingers and you're like, oh, I'm going to start using needles. Right. Yeah. It's this long, you know, dark, sad, lonely road um, of desperation. And one day you just put your arm out and you close your eyes and someone hits you. And then, and then from that point on, it's like, you've never done anything else other than use a needle before. Um, wow. so, you know, I, I had, I had gone right into the deep end with my drug use. Right. So, you know, you, you relapse the moment you get out. I mean, and did your wife know at that moment that you had relapsed? Well, she, so I, I, I left treatment. I relapsed. I went to her house, pulled out that little piece of paper certificate that they give yeah. you. Yeah. And I'm like, look at, I, I, I graduated, Dude. I graduated. Let's, yeah. Like, let's go for dinner. And she looks and she looks in my eyes and she's like, are you high? Like, no. How dare you accuse me of being high? I was just, I just completed 90 days in a treatment center. Like what kind of human are you? And yeah. so she knew, but I, I really, I really denied it. And it was only a matter of weeks before the act was up, right? Um, it doesn't take long. Like like they say, you know, it doesn't matter how long you're sober for, you go right back to where you were. For sure. There's, they, you, you, you know, you can't skip line in the progression. You, <laughs> you, 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 get, you get right back in your original spot. Yeah. So now, obviously, things go downhill because you got to a point where you were panhandling. Yeah. So let's, let's talk about that. I mean, that, I mean, talk about the lowest of lows is to be on a side of a highway asking people for money. Yeah, for sure. So, um, yeah, right after, right after I relapsed at a treatment, um, I tried the classic addict thing. I moved across the country, you know, try to run for my problems that didn't work. I came back and, uh, at this point, you know, I had no car. I had been fired from my job. Yeah. I'm stealing. I'm stealing from stores. Um, I pawned everything I own. Like I got, I got, I got nothing left. Um, and what actually ended up happening was I was, uh, I was stealing from stores, uh, whatever it was that my drug, my drug dealer wanted, and I would steal it and sell it to him for drugs. And then I got caught and charged. And um, I've always been very scared of going to jail. <laughs> So yeah. what ended up happening was I was like, Hey, that's it. Like, I, I can't go to jail. I, I'm not a good thief. Um, <laughs> right. So I, met, I, I met this guy and, and, you know, we were using together and um, he always had money. And I was like, where are you getting this money from? Because like, when you're, 
on that grind every day yeah. to get your money. Like it, it's, it's a, it's like a job. Like you're hustling every single day for, yeah. for a dollar. Right. And this guy's always got money to use. And I'm like, where are you getting this money from? And he's like, just meet me tomorrow morning, bring your bummiest looking clothes, meet me, meet me at the side of the highway here. So I did it. And, wow. and, and, you know, he had a, he had a Sharpie and a piece of cardboard ready and you make up your, your fake little sign or whatever it is. And, um, I would just put my head down and I would just, you know, what I call walking the beat and you just walk back and forth. And, um, it's crazy because it's really easy money. And it's actually, at least where I was, it was very lucrative. Like I could make $200 in a day. Really? I, I swear. I am not lying to you. Like you got to think how many lights go green and red within an hour. Right. Yeah. So if just one of those cars gives you a dollar, yeah, right. That's true. You do that yeah. for you do that for two hours. Like it adds up quickly. So we, like we would do shifts. Like we would do a morning shift and then an <laughs> afternoon shift. Like it was a whole gig. And, and I'm not trying to to make you know funny of this, but this is what I tell people is that it was easy money, but it came at a heavy cost. Yeah. Because I had lost all dignity for myself. I had Ooh. lost all self worth, self respect, yeah. love. Wow. You know, it was I had sold my soul to the devil. Um, yeah, and, right. and I was. I was at the lowest point. And the thing is, is that I grew up in a pretty small town. So uh, teachers, coaches, family, friends, you know, and anyone, a cousin, they're all seeing me and, and it's, it, you know, it's getting around. Is that Scott? Is that Scott? And people are reaching out to um, my daughter's mother. Um, so, the, and this is, this is right where, this is right where I get sober. So I, I panhandled for about maybe a month. And it was December 21st, 2015. It was a very cold, snowy, wet, gross day. Yeah. And at this point, my using, and I, I have to emphasize this, at this point, my using consists of trying to kill myself. Ooh, wow. You know what I mean? Like I'm yeah. using in a very suicidal way. I'm using in a way that I'm, I'm hoping I don't wake up. Oh, wow. Um, Cause I just, I just had nothing left. Like I remember thinking about Christmas was coming up and remembering no one's going to call me. I'm not going to see my kid. Like I was just at a very low place. So anyways, December 21st, 2015, I'm walking my beep. I walk up, I turn around, I walk down and there's my daughter's mother, Brittany filming me with her phone. Yeah. Oh, she's taking man. a video. She's taking a video. And I got a sign in my hand that says trying to get home for Christmas. <laughs> Like, like I'm in my hometown, you know what I mean? Like, I'm just, a, I'm just a scumbag. So she catches wind that I'm panhandling and she comes down to literally punch me in the face. Like she was angry, angry, yeah, angry, sure. yeah. angry. Um, and the second she see me, sympathy, empathy, love just washed over her. And she's, she just looked at me and she said, Scott, like, look at you right now. Like, do you, like, can you see what? you're doing yeah. like do you realize what you look like right now right like do you realize that so and so just messaged me and said they seen you like this isn't you this isn't the guy i fell in love with 10 years ago like, like this yeah. like, like you're gonna die and then so um she's like just come with me like let me buy you some lunch um and get you warmed up so i was like okay i'll come with you and then so i get in the car and then it's like let me take you to detox and I was like, I was like, ah, I don't know about detox. Like I got rent coming up and she's like, rent, you're not going to pay your rent. Like, you know, like, like right. just classic addict stuff. Right. Like I'm just right. pulling all, I'm just pulling all the rabbits out the hat. Right. At this point I'm desperate. <laughs> yeah, and she's sure. like, she's, she's like, what are you going to do? She's like, what are we, like, what are you, like, you going to do? You're just going to live on the streets. Like go to detox. So I don't know what happened, but I was like, fine, let's go to detox. And I've tried detox before. It's horrible. Right. Yeah. It's not a good experience, but it's necessary to get clean. Yeah. Um, so anyway, so she's like, Hey, let's go to detox. We call, we find a bed. Um, I go to a detox out of town so I can't run out the doors and, you know, get back to my life. Like I went to a detox like two hours away from where I live. So, um, and again, just like a classic addict, I convinced her to give me one last hit. I go to my drug dealers, I get one last hit, you know, some big scheme lie I meet up. And the day I went to detox, that was the day that, you know, my life will forever change, really. 
Um, so I'm in detox for a few days and I get through the major withdrawals, like, you know, the, the agonizing stuff. Right. And I can, yeah. I can actually get up and I can eat and I can converse with the rest of the population there. And this cloud of guilt and shame and loneliness and hurt and every, I was feeling all the feelings and I just felt like a loser. I just felt like a loser and I felt like a junkie and I felt like, I just felt like a scumbag. Um, I just, all these flashbacks, all these things I had done and what I had done to my daughter and everyone else in my family. And I felt like I could never be reborn from that. Like, how do you, how do you come back from Scott, the panhandler? Yeah. Right. You know, I'm looking, yeah, I'm looking at you right now, Scott, and I can't picture you panhandling, but again, (laughs) but that tells you how quickly addiction starts robbing you of all those things like you're talking about right now. And to the point where you lose your dignity to the, that you're willing to go ask people in a car for money. Um, But yeah, to see you now, I mean, people will see your picture here eventually, but you look great. I mean, I would never guess just by looking at you, but again, you can't judge people by their looks, but man, so grateful that you went into detox and things started to change for you. Yeah. Yeah. So, and this is where the miracles really started happening for me. So um, I just explained to you all those feelings I was feeling and, and, and how, and how do you ever come back from them? So then what happened is uh, a gentleman came in uh, to detox and his mom came in and, and they were Christians and she gave, she ended up giving me a book. And basically what it was, it's the Bible summed up from Genesis to revolution. And it just, to, just lays the whole Bible out how Jesus died, uh, sacrificed his life to pay uh-huh. your sin debt. Right. Uh-huh. Um, and I'm reading this book and it, and it's telling me, it's like, you are not defined by your past. Like you can yeah. be reborn, you know, you can remake yourself. And this like light bulb went off in my head. And, you know, uh, I like to explain it as that void inside of me was filled and, yeah. and, and I had never heard the gospel before. Like I, I, I had never heard the, like the whole gospel being laid out for me. And all of a sudden I just had this motivation and this willingness and this urge to dig myself up out of this hole. Yeah. Like I was, I was so motivated. And I remember like the next day I went to the front desk of the detox and I was like, I want a list of every single treatment center within, you know, two hours of here, right. Yeah. You know, print, print them off. Let's go. Let's start the applications. <laughs> let's like, let's do this. Right. Because yeah. that's the only way you're going to do it. Like, and, and here in, in Canada, um, we have you know, like universal healthcare, right? So you can get into treatments, you can get into treatment centers free, but you know, some of these places are 90 day wait list, 60 day yeah, wait list. Right. Yeah because they're all free, right? It's not like you can just knock on their door and be like, Hey, I'm here. Right. Like you yeah. gotta, <laughs> you gotta, you gotta grind it out. So, yeah. um, I ended up being very fortunate that the detox, um, capacity wasn't that high right then. So I was able to stay at detox for about 30 days. Um, they basically just let me live there until Jeez. I found a treatment center. Yeah. Jeez. It's very, very unheard of the girls. That is rare. That work, yeah. Yeah, she said, she's like, we've never had anyone stay here this long. But the reason why they let me stay is they could see I was motivated and I was grinding and I was trying to find the next step. Um, so I got, I get into a treatment center and it's a, it's a great place. And their motto is, we're going to give you a rope. You can either use it to dig yourself up out of the hole or you can use it to hang yourself, right? We're going to give you the toolbox on how to stay clean, how to get clean, how to, you know, learn how to live a life in recovery. You can either use those tools or you don't have to use those tools. This is all up to you. We're not going to force you to do anything. Um, And and that was exactly what I needed. So uh, treatment's going great. I'm, you know, I'm fully engaged. I'm doing everything I can. I'm doing lots of reading. I'm doing lots of Bible studies, 12 step meetings every single day you know, working on step fours and all the steps and all that stuff. Um, But I'd probably been there 60 days and you can only stay for 90. And I knew that, you know, in another month I had to find, I had to find my next step. 
And I knew I wasn't ready. I knew I wasn't ready to go back to my hometown yet because, you know, people, places, things. Sure. My, my mind wasn't ready yet. Um, so, so what ends up happening is I'm in a coffee shop. I meet this gentleman and I tell him my story, right? Just yeah. this random guy. I, I tell him my story <laughs> about how, how, you know, how I heard the gospel and it changed my life. So this guy is the director at a Bible college locally in this town. Um, and he's like, Scott, you need to go to Bible college. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm like, I'm like, bro, what are you like? What are you talking about? <laughs> I'm like, I was like, I'm 60 days clean. I have no money, right. no money whatsoever. I was like, I'm, you know, I was like, I, I, it was just crazy. It was, it was a crazy thought. And he looked at me. He said, Scott, if it's God's will, we can do this. Yeah. And I was like, okay, like I'm willing to try it. Like I'm like, let let's give it a try. So. Yeah. You know, I check out the campus, I get the papers and it's like $12,000. And the cool part about this Bible college is, is actually, um, it's really ministry based. So you go there for a year and like you live on campus. Um, everything you do is on campus there. And it's a really small campus and they actually do like summer camps and winter camps and stuff like that. So anyways, we did the papers. It's like 12 grand. And I look at him, I'm like, how are we going to pay for this? Like, are, yeah, like, are right. you like, are you paying for this? And he's like, <laughs> he's like, I'm not paying for it. And I was like, okay. And he's like, well, what we can do is, is like, we can apply for a bunch of scholarships. So we'll apply for the scholarships and then we'll create a GoFundMe page. So we created a GoFundMe page and that was fairly successful. And then what I started doing was I started speaking um, at local churches and sharing my story and they would give me an honorarium. Oh, wow. um, yeah. And um, you know, I would, I went and spoke at a jail and I went and spoke at um, uh, a school and I was basically just kind of selling myself. I was kind of like selling my story. And I was like, this is, this is my journey and this is my goal. And if you want to support me, it was almost like a missionary would, would get support to go do a mission trip. Right. 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 I was raising money for myself, but they weren't giving me the money. The money would just go directly to the school. Like I would never see the money. I would just say, if you want to donate to my cause, here's the website you can go on and just put the money towards my tuition. Um, so I I came up with all the money. (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) That is awesome. It, It was, it was really awesome. And it was like, it was just the most random people. Like I would get a statement on who would donate and I, and a lot of them would be anonymous. And, um, but I really felt like God at that time in my life was putting specific people in my life for yeah. specific purposes. Yeah. And if I, if I needed to learn a lesson in one part of my life, like he would bring someone in my life for that lesson. Yeah. Um, love it. So, yeah. So the next thing I know, like, again, I'm, I'm detox I'm treatment and now I'm enrolled in a Bible college and I'm just like, this is like, I don't even know what just happened here. So, um, I, yeah, I, I ended up going to Bible college and it's, it was an amazing experience and it taught me so much about myself and it taught me obviously a lot about God, um, and ministry. And, uh, in the meantime, so what I, actually, what ends up happening is October of 2016, my mother and my sister pass away oh. within two within two weeks of each other. So my mom passes away first of a heart attack, and then my sister two weeks later passes away from pneumonia. And I'm six months clean, yeah. right? And at this point, you know, in my circle, it's all eyes on Scott. Is yeah, Scott like how's he going to handle this? Yeah, that's it, right? Like, is yeah. Scott going to relapse? Is Scott going to go up the rails? Like, yeah. so it's all like you know, let's keep an eye on Scott. And I truly believe that God got me clean so I could help my family through this process because I was the rock. You know, I helped plan the funeral. I spoke at both of the funerals. I was able to be the shoulder that someone cried yeah. on, right? Um, and the other amazing part is, is that before my mom died, she got to see me clean. And yeah. I went I went for a meal with her and she told what? me how proud of how proud of me she was. What a blessing. 
Exactly. Yeah. The dog agrees too. The dog. Uh, agrees. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, it's all good. Um, no, this is life. You're good, man. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Here, give me a sec. I got this. Come here. I'm sorry. No, you're good. Um, yeah, so my mother passed away and I was able to be there. And it was it was it was a hard time in my life, but it was also very it was also very special. Well, what's amazing is here you are six months clean and sober. You got to deal with death of people that you're really close to, obviously, but you just said it, which was amazing. You were the rock. And the reason why I want to point this out, Scott, is I tell my clients all the time, addiction's the wake up call to your greatness. And here you are, you've gone through some difficult, difficult things. I mean, panhandling again, I, that just blows my mind. But yeah, no wonder you're the rock because look what you've had to go through and endure. And so I'm so glad you pointed that out. Uh, and as hard as that is and, and was at the time, for sure. Um, it's cool that you were the rock. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was, I really feel like it all, it all happened for a reason. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's life and, and life is hard. And, and, and I feel like that really strengthened my recovery, having that happen in, in, in early recovery. And it just yeah. kind of solidified, it solidified my mission to stay clean and, and just to be a better person. Yeah. Well, and I would imagine your wife and your family and your daughter and everyone's kind of blown away at that time, even like how good you were doing, like the way you handled it. I bet they were like, wow, look at, they may not have told you to your face, but inside they're probably going, geez, he's doing much better than we thought he would. <laughs> well, for sure. Honestly, some of them thought I was going crazy because I was in, <laughs> like, well, literally like, you know, one minute they, I'm, I'm. I'm panning the next minute. I'm like, Hey, I'm, I'm going to enroll in Bible college. And they're like, <laughs> like is this guy losing his marbles? Like, yeah, you know, they, they, didn't know to, they didn't know what to think. Right. Like you <laughs> lie to people and you deceive them for 10 years. Right. And then all of a sudden you have good intentions, yeah. but they don't, they like, it takes a while to gain that trust back. Right. And, sure. yeah. and, <laughs> and to, to, to see if, if his intentions are true or not. Um, so the first little while was like, okay, you know, he's, he's staying clean. Let's, let's kind of go with it here. And then, you know, and they started to realize like, this is, this is the real deal. Like Scott's really, he's putting in the work and, and he's doing yeah. what needs to be done. And, and we like being around him. And, and that actually brings, brings me back to my, my wife. She, you know, she pulled me aside and she said, you know, I, I think we should give this another go. Um, because we, we had kind of been like, we've been separated, you sure, know, she, yeah, sure. she distanced herself from me and my addiction and, you know, she saved me, got me off the highway. And then, you know, we were kind of co-parenting while I was away. Yeah. Um, and we were just learning to have a relationship outside of, you know, a, a love relationship. And then, and, and she's, and she said, she's like, I think we should give us another go. And, and I wanted to the whole time, but I didn't want to force myself on her. Right. Like I didn't want to be six months clean and be like, you know, yeah. try to have to convince her to get back with me because I was on such a mission to work on myself yeah. that I didn't want my motives to seem selfish. Like I was just doing it for you. For sure. Yeah. So, wow. well, that's impressive. You know, so now, you know, um, you, you've been clean for over six years, correct? That is, that is correct. Yes. So that, um, that, that is amazing um, that you went from, you know, panhandling. I always point that out to detox, to treatment, to Bible college, to speaking all over the place. And now, you know, you're six years clean. Um, I, I want to first just say congratulations. That, that is a, an amazing accomplishment. You thank know? you very much. Thank you. Yeah. No, you bet. And, and now you, you're, you're an owner of your own pool, pool installation company. Um, you, ha you, you have another child now. So you have two kids. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. So I have a, I now have a two-year-old son. So oh, you know, three okay. years. Yeah. So three years ago, we decided to have another one. And, and part of it was um, I was still absent during my daughter's younger years, younger years, um, you know, mentally, physically that I really wanted to experience that, uh, with my son. Yeah. So we, so we decided to, to give it another go. So my, my oldest is 10 and my youngest is two. 
Oh, wow. Congratulations, man. I'm Thank really you. impressed with you, Scott, and, and I appreciate you sharing that. I, ha I have a, a question that I like to ask people. Um, the question is this, if there's someone listening to you right now, Scott, who is struggling, maybe they're in the, you know, the height of their addiction and they're just down and out, maybe they're panhandling on the side of the street. What advice could you give them right now that might help that one person listening to you at this moment? Um, just give it a try right? Like just, just, just give it a go, be honest. And I hear it time and time again in the rooms is, is the higher power. You know, people struggle with that higher power so much. Um, and what I realize is that there's a lot more things more powerful than myself in this world and especially my addiction. Um, so I would say just, just give sobriety a try and just, you know, um, Give your higher power a try and look, find something that's more powerful than you and, and something that can guide you and something that you can look up to. No, I love that. You know, I, I think it do. I think a lot of people do struggle with the higher power or God or whatever they want to, you know, maybe refer that to. But uh, I do believe it's so important in our lives, especially in recovery. And uh, obviously, it was a big part of your recovery and it still is to this very day. Um, yeah. And I, I, I laugh when you said, you know, here you are, you were six months earlier, you were doing drugs and panhandling and then you're like, Hey, I'm going to Bible school. You know, it was like, what, you know, um, that's, that's pretty impressive. Yeah. It was definitely an incredible time in my life. And when I look back on those, on those first two years, it, it, it's very, very nostalgic. Yeah. Um, it's just a very special time. Like I didn't even, I didn't even have the chance to touch on some of the miracles that God blessed me with. Like, it's honestly, it's, it's wild. It really is. Well, share, share, share one with us. If, if, it's, if it's not too sacred to share. Yeah, no, for share sure. Um, us, please. Yeah, definitely. So uh, a really cool thing that happened to me was um, when, so when I got into detox, they ended up testing my blood and I had hep C. Mm. Uh, so I ended up contracting hep C through my IV use. Uh, so I went and seen a doctor at the local hospital and they did a bunch of liver function tests and this and that. And he said, listen, there's this, there's a new drug. It's not in trials. He said, but it's not, it's not approved for, you know, Medicaid or, or it's, it's not covered by what we call OHIP, which is what, co what covers our meds. Yeah. He said, so you're going to have to try and get on a list to get it covered because it's the treatment's $60,000. Wow. Yeah. So it's, it's a one pill a day, one pill a day for two months. And the pills are a thousand dollars a piece and the drug's called Harvoni. So he said, fill out these papers and then fill out this paper and then that, and then, you know, we'll throw them all together and we'll try to get you approved for it. So about a month later, I get a phone call from, from a pharmacy and they're like, Mr. Wilhelm, we're, you know, we're trying to find you. We're trying to find you to deliver your meds. And I was like, I'm not on any meds. And they're like, well, we have a prescription here for you. And I was like, well, I'm not on any meds. So they're like, well, did you, um, did you apply to get on the drug Harvoni? And I said, yeah, but that was like, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I haven't heard yeah. anything back. I haven't done anything. And they're like, well, we have your meds for you. Like, where are you? We'll bring them to you right now. Seriously? Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> are you sure? And they're like, yeah, like, you know, we'll bring them to you. So they, 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 they brought me to one bottle and then they did it in two separate deliveries. And he said to me, he said, these pills are worth a thousand dollars a piece. And to this day, I still haven't signed off on anything. I don't wow. know who approved it. Like, I don't know. I don't know anything, nothing. That's I don't even amazing. know. I don't even know where it came from. That is absolutely amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, it's interesting. I, th I really believe this, uh, Scott, that when we start doing the right thing, the best that we can knowing that we're not perfect, obviously, but it seems like these things start to play out in our lives. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So there is one, there's one thing that became apparent in my early recovery and I still live by the motto and it's really close to what you just said. It's just keep making the right choice. Yeah. Right. Even if it's the most small decision ever, just make the right choice and just yeah. do that over and over and over and over again. And then you're going to look back a month from now, two months from now, six months from now, and all those small little incremental good decisions and right steps you've made are going to amount to something. Yeah. And ne next thing you know, you've, you've achieved a goal that seemed 
unachievable and, and you've you hit a milestone that you didn't think you would hit. And it's all by just continuing to make the next best decision. Wow. That's great advice. I love that. Simple, simple yet powerful. Well, Scott, um, if yes. someone wanted to reach out to you and they wanted to know more about your story or wanted to learn more about you, what would be the best way for them to reach out to you? Uh, so they can, they can email me at uh, mannequin50 at hotmail.com. Okay. Uh, or they can email me at uh, scott at integritypoolbuilders.ca. Awesome. And my Instagram handle is uh, Mountain Manny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's M M T N M A N N Y, correct? Correct. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Well, Scott, I can't thank you enough for taking some time out of your busy schedule to sit down with me and share your story. It's, it's truly remarkable where you were and where you are now. And I, I just say congratulations. And I'm so grateful that God, your higher power was there for you when you needed it most and, and grateful that uh, your wife was willing to come down and go, dude, look at you. What are you doing? <laughs> you know, yeah, kind of a wake up sure. call kind of thing. But I go back to what I said earlier, uh, addiction is the wake up call to your greatness and look at all the great things you're doing now. And that just proves to me once again, that that greatness is in everybody. And I see it in you, Scott. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. So thank you so much. Well, there you go, folks, Scott Wilhelm, please check him out, check out his Instagram, send him an email. If you want to talk to him, I'll have his email and Instagram in the show notes. You'll be able to reach out to him, but thank you for tuning in. Um, if you, again, if you have someone who's struggling, um, give them the link to this belief cast and have them listen to Scott's story. This will inspire them, um, to help them get help, or at least, you know, reach out and ask someone for, for some guidance. And so please share that with them. I love you guys again, Scott. Thank you for your time today. Thank you so much. Till next time, everybody. Love you guys.